So as, uh, as Sam said, I'm the chair of the Behavioral Health and Healthcare Committee. I'm a supporter of getting to a universal single payer system. He didn't ask me about that, but I am. Um, whatever, whatever style we can figure out how to implement, I'll support. Yeah. So, all right. Like I was, like you were, you heard, I was asked to give a talk about how to be a good lobbyist, but to do it with a little bit of a twist. <laughs> and the twist, as you heard, was to talk about how to do it being a terrible lobbyist. And when this was suggested to me, I was like, wow, what a fun speech. <laughs> how could I resist? <laughs> um, I can't believe actually I didn't think of it myself, considering I've had to give this talk a few times in my political journey. Um, this was a solid suggestion, and I hope because of it, I keep you a little bit more engaged in my talk than you might otherwise have been. So here are a few pointers based on the assignment and my expertise. And uh, please know I've been a citizen lobbyist. Uh, I was also a professional lobbyist in my youth for students in education, higher education. I worked as a union leader where I had to try to figure out how to get along with the employer. I'm just gonna drop my remarks on the ground. I think it's just That's too okay. much difficulty here. You didn't provide me a proper podium. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we're into bargain contracts with top employers. And of course, I've been a state rep for going on almost 10 years. So in no particular order of importance, here we go. First, begin by just showing up to the representative or senator's office late by at least 15 minutes <laughs> or hell, maybe just barge in on them and demand to be seen. Okay, the staff love this. <laughs> this works really well, especially if you are not an actual voter or constituent of the representative or the senator that you want to talk to. Also, if you make an appointment for, say, yourself or maybe another person that you're bringing along with you, and then you bring 10 angry people along to intimidate the representative or the senator, that is totally fine <laughs> and often expected. <laughs> really, I mean it. Okay, it's done all the time and it's considered a best practice. <laughs> you probably don't know it, but being a politician is really an easy job to do well, Mary. <laughs> no problem. You don't have to keep track of very much. You often get elected knowing a lot about everything that you're voting on, and it's an especially easy job to accomplish in a 40-hour work night. <laughs> you don't have to do much research or check in with other people, and a lot of times you can really just regard your voters' feelings. I mean, most voters don't care what you stand for, and no one is ever going to point that stuff out to them right away anyway. I mean, only old people are using Facebook right now, and looking at the, the, this crowd, you know, Young people use TikTok, and I think most of you don't even actually know what that is. <laughs> you should probably also know that people who go into politics really don't care about doing a good job. Um, they just want to be flattered, be bribed, make a good salary, and have a job that is not very demanding with an important sounding title. <laughs> I mean, really, when I think about my colleagues, okay, I really can't think of one of them as decent and that I would want to be friends with for real. Even the ones I have known for 30 years, long before I ever got into formal politics. You should expect to be lied to. I mean, it's just what politicians do. You all know this, okay? I'm not sure why I'm even saying this out loud. It's like, it's like, it's like some kind of tip that you already all know. So my apologies for insulting your intelligence. <laughs> the staff of politicians are all losers who are expendable and don't need to be treated with any kindness or respect. I'm very serious about this. I don't even remember the names of the two people that are actually working for me. <laughs> I think one is Alan or maybe it's Adam. Anyhow, they totally expect you to be rude. And like I already said, showing up without an appointment or being late is just fine um, because it's an established work expectation that is adhered to all the time. How are we doing? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'll get a few laughs. Okay. And by the way, if some schlep who works for me says, I can give you 15 minutes tomorrow, be really indignant and insist on as much time as you need on a time that works for you and your schedule. <laughs> Here's a bit of a pro tip try to be the last person who talks to that politician. That way you can take advantage of our short attention spans. If that happens, it will probably go a long way with, you know, I'll remember what you tell me. 
On the other hand, I would feel free to make a really big deal if the politician is late to your meeting or something came up and they had to cancel on you because something happened. A meeting with another member of the legislature or someone on the governor's team about a bill or a budget can often be totally postponed, okay? <laughs> it's not like there are a lot of deadlines or things to get decided. If you're meeting with a rep or a senator who knows something about the thing that you are there to talk about, say he or she is the chair of the committee, it's really best to go on and on and first about the topic and why you're there and share your foundational knowledge. <laughs> Politicians, we have bad memories and forget basic facts all the time, even on the topics we've been working on for years. It's totally fine. It's not considered a waste of time at all. It's actually helpful. Please go on and on. <laughs> But don't worry if you don't know a lot about the bill or the budget or the idea either for that matter, because you really don't need to. The person you are meeting with is probably not going to ask any questions. You're totally allowed to ramble on and on and not get to your point. It's fine. It's done all the time. I think for an added flourish, I really like it when you take uh, an indignant tone or act like you're uh, like I'm stupid. <laughs> Don't ask a question like, how much do you know about this? Or have you heard the latest on this bill or this topic? I know I just said it's fine to be rude, but that is a rude question that I would not bother with, okay? It's very rude. It puts the representative or the senator on the spot. You should be totally insulted though if the representative or the senator forgot your name or your group's name, even if it seems momentarily like what happens to regular people sometimes when they get bad news. <laughs> it's inexcusable. I mean, he or she or they probably did not rush from thing to thing and their schedule is never cram packed because I already know you know it isn't. I mean, it show no forgiveness about this. <laughs> Please know that we have already read your very long, more than two paragraph email <laughs> about the bill or the budget and the more than two page handout that you have also attached with it for that matter. Now, this is probably the most important tip. I have a few others, but I'm, gonna, so I'm saying it right now. I want to emphasize it. So I'm going to I will repeat it at the end. Don't ever ask a direct question like, can you vote yes or no on a bill? Because that is also considered really rude. <laughs> I know I said it's fine to be rude, but this is the one instance above all others where you should not be rude. Just go on and on and talk a lot and act really important because you are. All the other ways you are rude, like being late and self-righteous and threatening are fine. A variation on this is when you know the representative or senator agrees with you and tells you, and then you keep going on and on, then don't entertain talking about the challenge of passage. I mean, you're only there to get their vote. You don't need to know that no one else understands the issue or has failed to talk to another key politician or that your idea is too expensive. It's not your job to be concerned about a strategy for actual passage. That's for the representative of the senator to figure out, not you. <laughs> Just stick to your self-righteous talking points. <laughs> you should get really mad when the representative or senator asks for more information or time to think about it. I mean, you sent them a ton of details and a really long email in advance. You just blathered on and on, and now they're asking for more time to think about it. Please. <laughs> And if for some reason you slip up and you promise to get back to them or provide more information, don't worry if you forget. No one cares. It's perfectly fine. Okay, I should wrap this up. I've got a lot of paper here at my feet. I think it's really good to throw phrases around like, do you know who I am? Do you know what I could do to your reputation? Or even after such a large, after I've made such a large donation to your campaign and this is how you repay me. A variation on the donation one is if you don't make one, okay, you didn't donate, you say, well, it's because of the large organization that that other person or organization made. I can see now that this meeting with you is pointless. Bringing your draft threatening press release and or social media posts so that they can see what you're going to say about them afterwards is also a very nice touch. 
<laughs> that is actually happening. Well, actually, most of this is happening. Yeah. <laughs> Again, I really want to emphasize that you don't ever have to, don't ever ask a direct question like, can you vote yes or no on a bill because it's considered really rude. Okay, I'm emphasizing that for a reason. <laughs> Just go on and talk a lot and act really important because you are. After all, they took the meeting with you, so you know better than they do, and they need to agree with you. Okay, before I summarize, are there any questions or maybe something that some of you think I missed or a question you want to ask me? <laughs> yes. Um, so what I'm getting from this is that if you tell me you only have five minutes, you really mean you got 30 minutes. Is that is that right? Exactly. Of course. <laughs> Mr. Sissick has, has done lobbying a long time. So he he has the, he has grasped this. Anybody else? Yeah, you? This is actually kind of a serious question. <laughs> <laughs> I, this I take this very seriously. All right, like I worked hard on this speech. Okay, a couple hours. Excellent. Okay. Excellent. I really appreciated it. What is your feeling about town halls? Are they useful? Are they good? Are they bad? Okay. Let's come back to that at the end. Extremely. <laughs> oh. Yeah, okay, go ahead. Yes, I will answer the town hall question. That's not a dodge. <laughs> so you said uh, two pages is, uh, you know, two page attachment is uh, is is uh, Long. perfectly fine. Yes. Right? Is uh, so would a one page attachment would that be considered rude? I, no, I mean even two pages. Okay, I'll break break. I'll break stride here. Not that rude. Okay, a lot of us will read something that's two, but if you start to send a complicated thing that's five pages with a five paragraph email with no space i mean remember i'm voting on forest policy roads and bridges education funding how much a judge should be paid okay like a state rep or state senator votes on all of that all right so you're you have a very important thing that you're talking about okay healthcare is very very important don't get me wrong but you are competing with a lot of other important things as well that I have to be knowledgeable about and vote on. Yes. Yeah. So I have, uh, oh, okay. <laughs> um, if you don't, if the person isn't like the chair, the, the chairman or whatever, if you don't know how much the person knows about a topic that you're going in to ask them about, like how how is the best way to approach them exactly? Like if I you think it, honestly, again, breaking rank. Ask them how much they know about it. Okay, and then you right. can sort of tailor your your question to their level of knowledge or their level of interest. You can also like, um, you can probably stop by a staffer's office or talk to another advocate and find out how knowledge. Like, I don't know about the state of Washington, but I find I I really do believe the Oregon legislature is actually quite approachable. Schedule permitting, you can get to your politicians in this state. You might, you know, schedule permitting, you know, it's a part time job in theory. A lot of my coworkers have to work, okay, but you can get to us. Okay. All right, go ahead. You got one. Okay, I'll take one more question and I'll summarize. No, I okay. just want to say thank you for having your speech on paper and reading it from there because <laughs> anybody can do this job. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> but when you write it out and you practice it a little bit, you remember the things you want to make sure you emphasize. Okay. I'm the other All right. So, in summary, it's fine to be late and show up with a lot of extra people. It's fine to be self righteous. It's fine to be kind of threatening. Being rude to the staff or hell, that matter, the elected person is also perfectly okay and is expected. It works really well to just lecture, especially if you are not that prepared or knowledgeable about the topic. Assume the representative or senator is stupid and they can try to tell you otherwise. Just know all politicians lie and proceed with your lecture. Take as much time as you need. The representative or senator is not that busy. There's no need to ask the elected leader how they plan to vote or if they have any questions that's, not, that's just not done. And finally, close the meeting with a polite, just you wait, Representative. <laughs> just you wait. 
And be sure to do it with a lot of tone. Okay, <laughs> remember, I said it's perfectly fine to be threatening. Okay, now, town halls are important. But what I often find is that in a town hall, especially if it's a group twice this size, and I, I'm going to say it in a slightly pejorative way because it's clear. It's not because what I mean, okay? But I, but I, if I say it a little bit more negatively, you understand. A lot of times when a person gets up to say something, they really, they're not really interested in what I think. They're interested in conveying what they need me to know or believe or feel, okay? And so I personally prefer to do that on a controversial topic in a small group or one-on-one. -on -one. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll pick another topic that's really hardcore and very difficult right now, okay? What do we do about the situation in Israel and Palestine, okay? Most of my colleagues who are smart, okay, who are not federal, okay, because I don't believe it's a federal issue, though there's, you could make an argument in this room about why a local politician should be forced to stand up and say something about that topic, okay? But it's a very difficult, sensitive, highly charged topic. And I don't want to answer that kind of question where there's no good answer in a room of 100 people. It's just never going to, it's not going to land. And the way I really experienced that um, on something a little less controversial, in 2020, like two months after George Floyd was murdered, people were sending me heartfelt emails that they wrote on their own, not created by an organization and said, please email your state rep or your state senator, but really heartfelt emails about racism and policing and pretty much the tone of like, what are you going to do about it? And then we would write a very heartfelt response. Okay, we would take our time, we would vet it, I would run it by my staff person, we would read it out loud. This would take like a half hour, 45 minutes. Hopefully we could use it when the next one came in, we could modify it a little bit. It never landed. Not one time. We never got it right. The person didn't hear my tone of voice. They didn't read that I was wrestling with a tough topic or that I agreed with them, or I disagreed with them on one small thing, it didn't matter. It never landed. You always got a reply, basically, that was to the tone of not good enough. So finally, I just said to my assistant, we're just going to call these people. And he got really nervous. He's like, you're going to call all these people? And I was like, yes, I know how to talk to people. I've been in tough rooms. I'm a union organizer. I get yelled at all the time. I understand. I said, let them yell at me. And then I can yell back. And then we can have a discussion. And I said, let's not call them right away. <laughs> let them calm down after they sent their angry email. Okay, we can call them next week or two days later. Okay, but like, just let me have a conversation. And it takes just as much time as writing that heartfelt response that didn't land at all. In fact, made it worse. Okay, so that's my thing about town halls. I will do them, but I don't enjoy them because I don't think, I don't think they work um, as a communication tool or as an advocacy tool, but they, they are a necessary thing in a, in a line of work where you have to represent 75,000 people and you just can't have a one-on -one conversation with everybody. Okay, so, yeah, okay, go to them, okay, like, you know, bring your group and hold your sign and ask an intelligent question, but try to also have small group meetings and show up to committee and bother me for five minutes after I'm done. Okay. I broke stride a few times. Um, so just in case, you know, you're recording this and loading up to TikTok, I feel like I should just say a few things here at the very end, okay? So a few actual tips. First, be honest, not that you would lie, all right? But, and be respectful, okay? This is actually a very, very hard job, okay? And you know you're living in a dictatorship, or a fascist country when you can't criticize your leaders, okay? I understand that, okay? But you can still show me a modicum of respect, okay? Yeah. <laughs> All right, you, you can just be a good human, okay? Be clear about what you're there for and what you want, okay? And concise, where, you know, where the person stands on the issue, you know, get an answer from them about where they stand. You really, I wanna emphasize that, I've been a lobbyist. Don't waste your time going into a meeting with a decision maker where you don't leave attempting to understand how they feel, how they might vote, okay? And you might not get an answer you like. They may, they may say, maybe, I don't know, I need more information. Maybe in Oregon it's kind of like, no, basically. I don't know if you know that, <laughs> all right? Or they might tell you no outright, okay? 
um, just be polite and accept the answer. And now you know what you're dealing with. And now you know, like, you got to try harder, bring new information, bring more political pressure to bear. That's okay. I've had people who didn't agree with my stance on vaccination and they got an answer out of me that they didn't like, threatened to vote me out of office. That's part of the process. And I said, I've done that too. I've threatened to get people voted out of office as well. Keep me posted. <laughs> <laughs> If you only do those three things, okay, you'll find that lobbying is nothing more than building good relationships and following through. Okay, so please just do those three things and do the exact opposite of everything else that I just threw down. <laughs> Um, and all seriousness aside, many of us feel that a legislator will pay more attention to us if there are more of us in the room or we have more signatories to an email. Does that play any role in your? I mean, yes, of course it does, right? Like, I, you know, it's part of revealing that a lot of people care about this or that a voter cares about it. And I think, you know, if, Sometimes, like, if you're going to a meeting, it's going to be friendly and you bring a lot of people, that's a really good meeting. Like, I like those meetings. We take a picture, it gets posted on social media, okay, you know, like, but sometimes some of you, you know, need to meet with legislators that really don't agree. And they need to, part of the process is bringing a group of people to them, so have them experience it, make them sweat a little bit, right? And you know, again, you can do that in a way that is respectful, okay? It's obvious, right? Like, yeah. I got 20 people in my small little office, okay? And they're like, we want you to vote for this. And I'm like, I don't think I can. We can't afford it. Like, that meeting is a downer, yeah. okay? I know it. They know it, okay? But that's part of the process. And I might try to say, like, help me find some money. What tax can we raise? You know, what... What other program could we cut? Okay, which is a tough question, right? But that that might be the dodge I give, you know. But like, but yes, I think um, I think thanks for that lead in. Um, those offices aren't that big, right? right? right. 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 So senators' offices are big. Bigger. Representatives' right. offices are small. And, and and if you're in a hurry, this like they, and, and you can't really move out to a space that's bigger. Bringing in a lot of people is sometimes not good for your movement because everyone that you've invited hopes to have their voice heard and they can shut, feel shut out at the end of the process. Right. So bring only the amount of people that can accommodate in a meeting, I guess, would be a suggestion. Yeah, I mean, or, or have them outside. You know, not everybody wants to have a public speaking role. And again, you know, if you have a town hall, bring 20 people to the town hall and hold up a sign and have take hold lots and say, okay, which two or three of us are the most articulate or the most passionate, can say it the most succinctly, don't feel like we need to give a speech of our own. Yeah. yeah. I'm finally one of your constituents. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, the, the, whom should we talk with next question? I, I, my experience, and it's not that extensive, is representatives and senators are loath to answer that question. Oh, like me tell you how like somebody is going to vote or why oh, they're well, voting? No, it's it's okay. You're on board. Whom should yeah. we approach next? We are loath to do that because so I have to try to maintain functional relationships with my colleagues who are equal to me in terms of the vote and their ultimate power in their districts, okay? But maybe run a committee where I want my bill to be heard or run the budget committee where I want my bill to be paid for or the program to be enhanced. And so we're reluctant to do that. You should, you can try and ask and say like, who else do you suggest, okay? But I'll just, you know, I don't know about the state of Washington, but in Oregon, I don't think I'm giving away a big trade secret here, okay? You can go research their names, okay? When it comes down to the big items, okay, and maybe setting up the Universal Healthcare Commission is not the big item, okay, but figuring out what's the next step we're going to take to pay for it, that might be a medium-sized item, okay, um, or setting up the basic health plan, 
so that we take an incremental step toward universal coverage by getting more people um, into Medicaid, even though they're they're not at 133% of the federal poverty level, they're up between 133 and 200. I think I'm saying that right. Am I saying that right, Dr. Goldberg? Okay, good. Eight years, I finally learned all this. <laughs> um, lost my train of thought. Okay, so th there's four there's four people that really run the state. Okay, that's the speaker, the Senate president. Okay, and the two ways and means co chairs, and maybe their staffs help them. Now, it's not to say I'm without in without influence. Okay, that is not true. Okay, I'm the chair of an important committee. I've been there a while. I know what I'm doing. I've run bills that have gotten passed, okay? But you do kind of have to get those four people to kind of give you the okay. And they might not give it to you immediately. You know, the political process might play out and then they kind of go, okay, I guess I got to give notes that nurse staffing bill, you know? But, but I mean, it, those, you know, so like, like, Okay, Speaker Rayfield, is, there's a group of you that are from Corvallis, okay? He's running for Attorney General. So, like, your little window of opportunity to really sort of get him is closing, okay? Because you're running for something else, right? And it's not going to be about this, you know? Um, but meanwhile, he's super important. Like, I think an easy, this is a tough issue. You know, figuring out a tax scheme to pay for single payer. I mean, I think you all have a sense of how to do it. Passing that's really hard. I'm not trying to put that on Representative Rayfield. I don't think he could pass that right now, okay? But to think that we wouldn't figure out how to deal with this Pac-12 debacle while he is speaker and, <laughs> and we have Oregon State, it's a, really? you know, yes. it's a company town, okay? <laughs> We're totally gonna figure that out. <laughs> okay. It's, it is important, okay? If you're important state in your backyard, that is goddamn important. <laughs> <laughs> it's not that important. I'm not a big football guy, believe it or not. But like, but it, yeah, that's important. Politics is local. Yeah. He cares about healthcare too. He really does. Okay, but he also cares about Oregon State. Yeah. <laughs> For sure. Yes, about this. Um, can a, a fifteen minute visit with you be just as meaningful on Zoom as in person? Yes, I think so. I think it's better in person. Just like most things are better in person. But if you know me, and it's really about check-in, like you want to know the status of the bill, you know, you're trying to tease out of me where the roadblock is, we could probably just do that by phone or by, yeah, or by Zoom. Yeah, but if you're like new, trying to establish a relationship, I recommend doing it in person first. Yeah, try to meet them on their turf. Yeah. One of the tips you left out was similar to- You were supposed to stop that earlier. I try to, but I'm a quiet guy. <laughs> a couple of days ago, some protesters went to U.S. Congressman Smith's home and painted signs about the oh. Israel Palestine issue yeah. on his uh, uh, garage door. What can we paint on your garage? Yeah. <laughs> well, I will tell you, I don't have a garage, so you're going to struggle to do that. And, you know, this is going to sound like kind of a weird answer, but like, I think that's horrible. Okay. Because what it does ultimately is like, hey, I'm on a very elaborate board of directors where at least you get to pick, you get to vote me out if I suck. Okay. Like, I'm not a king. I'm, you know, I'm not a noble. Okay. I, my, Bob and Gloria were middle class people from Ohio and in, in Michigan, who met at Michigan State their senior year, okay, and got married after dating for a year, okay, they were, you know, and I mean, my dad's rolling in his grave having raised this socialist, and my mother still can't believe that I'm doing this, okay, so, but I also, as an advocate, as a union leader, have occasionally engaged in tactics, I don't think I've vandalized people's property, but I probably came up to the line to some of those manager types, Okay, in terms of making them feel very uncomfortable. And, and so that's part of the process. But there's a consequence for that too. Okay, for your cause. All right, like, you know, like I, a different advocate when I was learning said being rude or polite is a tactical decision. <laughs> okay, it doesn't, it wasn't because you were rude that I agreed with you. 
okay, or it came around, or not even necessarily because you were polite about it either, okay? Though maybe that made for a better meeting, okay? But like it's the argument, the power, the politics, all that, okay? Sometimes a situation calls for righteous anger. You're entitled to be mad. And an elected leader needs to understand that. Uh, but other times, you know, I, I'm entitled to a monicum of respect. There's a question online. Okay. Bruce Thompson, can you ask your question? I'm starting to sweat up here, Bruce. All right. So, you know, come on, let's get to it. Unmute. Still have to unmute you, Bruce. Um, yeah, so my hand was raised actually for Bruce Goldberg. Um, so, uh, but with this opportunity, uh, uh, Representative Nas, um, we we have a, a three a three person group from Mid Valley Healthcare Advocates that would like to visit you uh, to show you. Um, what our anal analysis uh, shows about public option um, and uh, would appreciate uh, when we would be able to do that. And I'll, we'll call your office. Okay. We're, totally all, cool. we're, and you we're should, also HCAO members too. Um, and you should, when you do that, like, here's a little bit of a pro tip that's real, okay? You should say, hey, it was really nice to meet you. At the event, um, what is the date today? Is at the Kennedy School on December third. Um, you were really gracious to take my question. I'm following up and wondering if I get 15 minutes of your time. You know, and when and because you're coming from Corvallis, right? You said from the back. Yeah. Um, you know, like we we will be in Salem during um, legislative days in the middle of January. I think it's like the 10th, 11th, and 12th, or whatever that is. And I, my schedule is not so full that I can't get a meet that you can't get a meeting on the topic area that I work on, by the way. All right. Um, or, you know, during February, especially if it's just good information you need me to have and it's not necessarily about a bill, that's fine. Great. Thank you so much. Okay. I look forward to meeting you in person. It's great. Yeah. It's great. Tom, that's a good, that's a good suggestion. Thank you. Well, not off the book yet. Oh, okay. You uh, factors that you didn't mention were approaching a legislator who is not our representative. We're you know doing extra vehicular work here. We're not a constituent. Or the compounded challenge of visiting a legislator of another party. Are there? tips for us when we are I mean, cold calling someone i mean that that's hard right like part of my triaging of my schedule is i go are they a voter are they you know a constituent of mine and then are they working on a topic area that i'm responsible for in my committee um or a bill that i have sponsored you know like it's, i feel like it's in my portfolio like like another thing i work on very actively right now is arts and culture funding trying to help the all sorts of performing arts in particular right now. Um, and that topic is really struggling. I'm losing uh, <laughs> different topic. Um, so it just, it, it's harder, right? Cause I, part of what my staff and me are doing is trying to manage my time. And right now I'm able to do this full time. Like plenty of my colleagues can't afford to do that. They need to work. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's even more difficult. They may, sometimes they will pawn you off on their, legislative assistant. I don't tend to like to do that because I don't find getting a download from them as impactful as actually talking to the person. Shocking. But sometimes that's what you have to settle for. That's just how it is. Um, so I think, you know, if you're if you're trying to meet with a rural legislator who's not on the Behavioral Health and Healthcare Committee about single payer, you might struggle to get a meeting. I would say try harder to get your organization to get a toehold and that, that reps city or county mm -hmm. or a city or county, you know, in their area if they have more than one. Um, and that's just basic good organizing too, for that matter. You know, and they, they might, 
they might not agree with that person, okay, but they'll probably be a little more polite to them than they would be to a rude advocate, right? Who like just, you know, like, hey, I sometimes when I was a, a lobbyist in my youth for higher ed, I did follow male legislators into the bathroom. It's not the best look. I got to be honest with you. Okay, but like, you know, but like I did do it. Okay, because I couldn't get a meeting with that senator and they were in charge of my budget. Okay, and like, they were rushed off the dais, like, or you you bum rush the, the dais, you hang out, you're called a lobbyist because you're hanging out in the lobby, okay? <laughs> Literally waiting for a chance to get somebody because you can't get a meeting with them. I mean, and it's not always because they're avoiding you. I mean, sometimes they are, okay? But other times it's really like, I'm just busy. Yeah. So do the best you can, you know, that's not, that's tough. Your issue, I feel like, you know, single payer is pretty partisan, but universal access to care where everybody has the same style of benefit and pays the same amount of money to see a doctor or a dentist, you know, that, that it's pretty hard for a Republican to stand up and say, that sucks. Yeah. yeah. You should have to pay 20 bucks to get your eyes checked and you should only have to pay five. I mean, you're you're gonna find it. That's a really hard line to take, all right? Like, I just think you're gonna. So you know, choose your words a little more carefully, and that's okay. That's part of the art of this. Words matter. You can say single payer with me. <laughs> Would you say your last name? Nose rhymes with dose. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. I hear it both. You know, yeah, because I don't correct yes. people very often because okay. it's Thank rude you. and it's not worth it. <laughs> Not yeah, so no surrounds with those. Thank you. Well, thank you. Oh, wait, wait, wait. Get the, oh, get you got your president elect in the back there. Um, thank you for being here. That was really terrific. Okay. okay. Really appreciate it. Sam, it was such a great idea. Yeah. Yeah. Great job, Sam. Um, uh, I, I'm curious, not to knock your position, but um, in a formal life, I was a staffer for a little bit in life. And I'm just curious in the context of talking about these other districts. What what would value is it for us to continue to advocate for the staffers and the people that they influence? There's I just be curious your perspective from the Senate and uh, when you say staff. advocate for this, like advocate with the staffers, with the staff. Yeah, okay. We have so staff. so what shape or form does that? Look I mean, like? it's really hard to know because each legislator runs their office very differently. Okay, so some legislators have like a scheduler and an email response and a phone person and a greeter, and then they have a policy person. And so if you know that, you probably wanna meet with the policy person, right? Um, some do a really good job of getting a download about what, so for example, I think if you're the Ways and Means co-chair, it's probably physically impossible to meet with everybody that wants you to fund their bill or their budget or their program. And so that staff person's probably keeping an Excel spreadsheet of a list of all the asks to run by their boss. Okay, at least that's what I think every Ways and Means person that I've seen in my chamber do. So, you know, that's probably a worthwhile meeting, actually. Like they probably are going over that with their boss, or the rep. Um, you know, like in my office, um, I got trained to have everybody do a little bit of scheduling, a little bit of constituent email, a little bit of phone calling, and then say, John, here's your policy bucket, and uh, Bruce, here's your policy bucket. So they had each had interesting work. Like, you know, somebody had a portfolio, they each had a portfolio of bills and topics. So you just have to kind of, and most staff are really pretty nice, actually. You just ask them. Uh, yeah, Bruce, help you. Bruce has a question for that other speaker. <laughs> Bruce, go ahead. Oh, um, so the question that I had for uh, Dr. Goldberg? Yeah. Okay, yeah, so, um, uh, hi, Bruce. Uh, Uh-oh, oh. we lost it. Uh, we lost the whole thing. Uh, everybody's yes, moving except you, Bruce. <laughs> You're frozen, Bruce. Okay. This might be a private conversation. Wait, wait. Here. Okay. 
this might be a private conversation. We're kind of projecting Oregon State now to Michigan State because Jonathan Smith, as the coach, has gone to Michigan State, my alma mater. I don't know if we ever knew this. My mom went to Michigan State. Right, so I understand. My dad has very family feelings about this <laughs> Oregon State, Michigan State connection. <laughs> uh, <laughs> You know, I have to take some time away to process that, actually. We'll get back to you. I hadn't thought about it. Bruce, Bruce can rescue you. Uh, okay. Yeah, go ahead, Bruce. No. He's, he's one line. Bruce, go ahead. Um, were, were you able to hear the question? No, we were not. Bro. Okay. So my question was in, uh, in the waiver situation where we're pooling Medicare and Medicaid money, um, would CMS, do you envision CMS having uh, a problem with uh, Medicaid money that isn't spent on health care for Oregonians uh, going into uh, CCO's uh, reserves? Uh, would, would that present a problem with CMS? <laughs> Well, the short answer is, you know, right right now they they don't allow that. So, um, you know, the short answer is no. I mean, they expect for dollars to go <laughs> into reserves. I mean, this is the whole thing about waivers to put people in managed care, and they understand that they need to have sufficient reserves to ensure that they deliver care. Having said that, you know, a better argument is. Wouldn't it make sense for that to be backstopped by the by the state or by the federal government as opposed to mm -hmm. by the, uh, giving the money to the plan yes. itself? Yes. Yes. Did you hear the answer, Bruce? Yes. Uh, thank you, Bruce, for um, taking that difficult question. <laughs> it's a difficult question. Mm -hmm. I have Which, a question for Representative Nose. Oh, um, okay. Hold on just a second, Betsy. Sorry, Linda. Sorry. Hold on. Oh, Which kind of brings me to another question. Can you hear me? Okay. Which kind of brings me to another question that I've always had in the back of my mind. In the back of my mind. I don't know. Oh, there. No, I don't know. Um, is Right now, our for-profit insurance companies are holding a lot of reserves that came from our healthcare dollars. Um, how much, if we, if a, a state uh, were to create a, a single-payer plan, how much of those reserves should actually go back to the people who pay them? So I, I'll just say that would be a subject of the policy discussion around establishing that plan and the yes. finances for it. it I mean. That's a fair question, and how we answer that is part of the policy and political process. Yeah. Tom, would you have a? Yeah. I think our battery's low. I guess you want to use your. Yeah, sure. Here, use this one. Yeah, there's someone online there. Oh yeah. Sure. Sure. So who's? Go ahead, One more. Somebody online. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. So imagine, um, rather than a bad lobbyist, now we're talking about, a, <laughs> if you pardon the expression, a bad legislator who has behaved in a way very similar to what you've just described, the bad lobbyist. Okay. <laughs> as in uh, quickly going to, you're wrong, the legislators you're working with are wrong, I'm right, this is what is going to happen. Live with it. <laughs> I mean, some of my colleagues do talk like that. I think not very many and not consistently with that tone of voice. But, um, you know, if you are consistently as a politician, that's your go to. Um, Provided you're not of a party that is, you know, overwhelmingly, you know, opposite from what the district is or whatever, you're going to get unelected. Um, it, you know, you it's a, it takes a, it takes a proper campaign to fire an incumbent. Okay, um, this is a little off the subject, but just bear with me. Okay, 
So let's not break down the policy of it. Let's just let me use an example because it's a really good one. So in 2019, I took a vote to change PERS funding allocation. I'm trying to choose my words very carefully. Okay. <laughs> and that change meant that employees on PERS were going to have to contribute some of their wages to the cost of their retirement benefit. And because of that vote and that bill, many of us believe that we were able to get Senator Johnson to vote yes on a big tax increase, a billion dollar a year tax increase, a grocery tax for schools. All right. And I feel as a union person, I've occasionally bargained contracts that weren't awesome. I could explain that vote to union members and get yelled at and say how terrible that was or whatever. Okay. But like I could explain it and why that was a a necessary thing changed to make. We had to do it. We were stuck with it. Okay. Um, and people disagreed with that. They disagreed with it vehemently and they ran somebody against me. It was totally within their right. And what I would just say is if you're going to do that, um, you have to fire the incumbent. So my opponent was smart. She was a good opponent. She was articulate. She had good values. Um, I I don't know how effective a legislator she's been because she's very strident. She's very young, not to deride on young people, but she was pretty young, okay? Um, and hadn't probably had a lot of experience in trying to work out a complicated deal and maybe compromise a little bit to get most of what you want, okay? Um, and, um, you know, she just... She talked about her awesomeness, but she didn't talk about how I sucked. And I don't suck, okay? Like she, there wasn't gonna be much of a campaign that she was gonna be able to run, run about how I sucked, okay? But so like, if you're, if you're dealing with somebody like that, that's what, you're, that's what you're doing. You're running a campaign saying how much that person sucks and how much the candidate you're trying to put instead doesn't. And it's just, that's just really hard, but that's our system. And it is possible to do it. And I've had colleagues that absolutely lost reelections because they did something pretty tough or bad. Um, and their opponent ran a good campaign and fired them. We have a question from Linda Craig here. But don't, if you're gonna, you know, if you're gonna do that, have a lot of confidence that you're gonna win. Cause you're gonna, you're gonna make that person an irrational enemy of yours for a long period of time. I mean, I don't mean, leave a wounded animal to roam in the forest. Yeah, okay. you said it, not like... Linda, you're on. Okay, thanks. Uh, Representative knows, do petitions matter? Yes, I think they do. I mean, do they overly matter? You know, not, I mean, like, there are, like, at the end of the day, we get elected because we represent the majority of our voters or a, a sound majority of our voters. And to the extent that you can, like, okay, so in my district, I probably don't need a big single payer is amazing petition coming my way. I've already signed on to your thing. I support it. Um, that's a waste of your effort. To the extent that you can run that kind of situation in a representative that maybe hasn't thought about it, is maybe from a more moderate district or a place where a Republican could actually win, or maybe they've even indicated to you they don't think it's a good idea. They don't think it will work, okay? To the extent that they get a bunch of letters or postcards or a petition with people from their district with names on it, some hopefully that they recognize saying, hey, we think you need to give this another chance. I mean, yeah, I think that works. But you, you know, it's it's part of it's it's got to be done strategically. Thank you. Yeah. I want to respect your extra five minutes here, whatever you got. Oh, your extra five minutes. So thank you so much for your time. Right on time. Um, how much, you know, we've got a constitutional right now at affordable health care, yeah. thanks to you carrying the word forward to the next level. Um, how do you think we can utilize that? Yeah, that's a great question. You know, there's a couple of places, you know, we don't have an answer here, but something I've been thinking about a lot. I mean, I think, I think it's useful as a rhetorical tool, okay, but it didn't, the reason we were able to pass it is because we've kind of threaded the needle about saying it's not a right above safety, which could mean we should improve, and, and, and I'm going to use it, I'm going to choose a better word, 
uh, in, enlarge the correction system, which I don't think we should do, okay? Um, or fund higher ed with free tuition, okay? Like we don't, we didn't say healthcare gets some, it gets like first in line or, you know, and and I, I don't think that would pass, you know, because if our state's burning down from a bunch of wildfires, that's probably gonna take precedent, right? If we're having a pretty bad, um, behavioral health challenge because we have drugs on the street that are so powerful that we've never seen before and people are living in tents while they're using them to sort of self-medicate. Um, that's going to get some of our largesse, you know, and the voters kind of want it to. So. Yeah, wouldn't all those things be much better and easier if we have the universal health care system to back up? All well, of course. Things? Yeah, no question. I mean, like, I, to, 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 the, to Dr. Goldberg's point, like, it's yeah, you have to have the right moment to get the waivers you need, okay? And maybe that we keep chugging along, that right moment might show up, okay? Um, somebody should run a whole workshop about ERISA, Ugh. okay? And how do we deal with that? Because you can't get a, an ERISA waiver, can you? You can't, they don't right? Have it yet. Yet they might not ever. You know. yeah. work around it. There's a workaround. Okay, yeah, we talked about this. I remember because you took my anxiety down about being the chair of the healthcare committee by explaining it. Okay, but you took it back up when I said, "Okay, great, we'll just let some of these big employers opt out because they have good health insurance." Okay, and we'll have a single payer for three million people, and that's fine. You're like, "No, dude, we need all their money." Yeah. Everybody's gonna... <laughs> so that's hard. Okay, like if you're not going to make any exceptions. Yeah. And and sometimes good policy is about making exceptions. Uh, if you're not going to make any exceptions, okay, you know, if you need, if you can't have any exceptions. I mean, maybe you can. I don't think you said you can't have any exceptions. You just said it's a little more expensive. The taxes have to be higher if you're going to have some exceptions. John, you get the last question. Yeah. Well, I think this is fair. Okay. You mentioned, I, do I get to be the judge of that or is the yeah, audience? Yeah. <laughs> you, you happen to mention my most favorite policy decision that the task force made. Okay. You mentioned that for Republicans, it resonates when people are treated differently. Yeah, it does for any politician, okay. really. Okay, but dramatically different, yes. And so you know, or you may not know, but in the task force report, the payment factor for Medicaid is about 85. The payment factor for Medicare is 100. Okay. The payment factor for commercial is 170. Why do you think folks are going to the suburbs? Uh, why is Amazon putting their clinics in the suburbs? Why is nobody in Lakeview? Because there's only 10% commercial. Okay. A single payer could the actuarial term could normalize reimbursement. I, I don't I don't disagree. Okay, like and, and, and well your comment made me think. I don't think the best regulator in the country could force a normalized rate across a competitive market. You're probably right. And I think it would be interesting to challenge a, I mean, a system to I mean, come up. Right. There will always be racism and, and discrimination as long as that, that payment factor differential exists. Yeah. No true equity. I mean, here's what I would say, which is I think. Let's not make a Democrat or Republican, though that's a pretty easy shorthand, but there are Democrats that don't support a single payer system either. They do support a universal system, okay? But they're not so down yet, they're not convinced about single payer. And they have, some of them have pretty smart reasons. I have to listen to some of them, okay? Um, I, I think the challenge, I, I think when you're talking about people that don't support a universal system, I think you gotta constantly highlight how unfair it is. I think that's where you start. Like I hear you about, you know, we could rationalize the system yeah. and the rates yeah. and you know, blah, 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 blah. And you know what? That kind of just went over yeah. my head anyway. And I sort of understand it. Okay. But it's easy to understand 
I have to pay a hundred bucks for my insulin and a poor person who is lucky enough to be on Medicaid, okay? Unlucky for other reasons, okay? But for healthcare purposes, pays nothing, okay? Like that just, that just gets at their craw. It gets at everybody's craw. It's not right, all right? And so like, I think to the extent that we keep talking about that, or like I, I say to my, I say to the Republicans on my committee, the speaker out of Corvallis cares about healthcare. He gave me thoughtful Republicans on my committee, okay? Who care about the topic, who are interested in it, okay? And I have joked with them. I've said, your constituents are going to come to you with problems and you're going to learn. Oh, no, we can't do anything about that. That's ERISA. Oh, no, we can't do anything about that. That's Medicare. Oh, no, we can't do anything about that. We got to go ask CMS first if we're allowed. Okay, like I'm saying, you're going to get tired of that. And you're going to realize, boy, a system that is run by the state where you're on a very elaborate board of directors, where you decide with a lot of input is a way better way to be a problem solver and discern, you know, how much a dentist should get paid and all of those stuff, you know, versus an ophthalmologist versus a behavioral health therapist. Like you're going to come around. They keep saying no, but I, I, I hold out, you know, like, plus, you know, like if you're in a, if you're in a state of Oregon regulated plan by the Department of Consumer yeah. Business Services, those plans suck. Yep. Okay, they're not very good health insurance most of the time. And and we don't regulate a lot of that because there's just not a lot of people that are on those plans. Like most people are on Medicare, Medicaid, a government insurance plan, like if they're a teacher or work for a school district or they work for the state or a county or a city, those are usually pretty good. Um, or they're on an ERISA plan if they have a good employer. Like no, no wealthy employer is on a DCBS regulated mm -hmm. plan. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I'm ready. Thank you. Yeah. I'm going to call the plan to the future speaker on December 12th. The city's having a panel on the Portugal trip to see how did Portugal somehow make drug legalization possible? And we haven't. So this is the first, Rob is going to be part of the new City Club of Portland Friday Forum. It's going to be on a Tuesday noon. <laughs> new Friday. I'd like to thank both of our speakers, uh, Bruce Goldberg and Rob Max. And thank you. There will be, in any minute, food to take home. And for those speakers who missed the meal, it's better cold. <laughs> Thank you all very much. Good to be ordered. Announcements? Announcements, of course. All right. David Loud, Seattle. My primary, thank you. My primary organization is Puget Sound Advocates for Retirement Action. We have been building a statewide and national campaign over the last couple of years against the total privatization of Medicare. Mm -hmm. I'm very happy that one pair of states, which both Oregon and Washington are affiliated with, recognizes that state-based single payer is the pathway, the most likely pathway to a universal national single payer plan. The rate of privatization of Medicare right now is within perhaps five years of gobbling up the rest of traditional Medicare. So if we wanna have even the possibility of a national single payer plan, we really need to get on board and do something now against the, private, the total privatization of Medicare. So what I'm announcing here, is tomorrow at 5 p.m. Pacific time, Bizarre is putting on a national webinar under the title, Is Medicare Advantage Preying on People of Color? And, and the speaker is Dr. Claudia Fagan, Chief Medical Officer of Cook County Health in Chicago, and immediate past, well, I'll skip more of her credentials. Anyway, uh, this webinar will cover the impact of Medicare Advantage on racial disparities in healthcare outcomes and access to healthcare services for Medicare beneficiaries. Most of you are not members of Pizarra, but if you go to Pizarra.org, P-S-A-R-A.org, you should find the way to register for this webinar. I encourage you. We've had a number of webinars. This one should be terrific. And as I say, if we lose traditional Medicare, it's going to be harder to hell to get a national single payer plan. Thank you. Yeah. I have some bumper stickers. 
please take them. I don't want to take them home. <laughs> and I have in my, the trunk of my car, which is right outside, a whole bunch of these lawn signs. They can be window signs. Uh, particularly, I think this is germane to the Oregon people because it says that uh, Oregon organizations are sponsoring it. But if um, people in Washington want to take pictures of it and replicate it, you're welcome to. Thank you. Mike, did you have? Yeah, a couple of things. Uh, one is that we can stay in this room until well, a little before four to socialize, keep conversations going. And then after that time, um, those who want to stay or are staying here tonight and want to meet, uh, say, at the boiler room, and they can reserve a table. So um, maybe as we spend the next half hour, uh, decide who's going to be wanting to do that kind of thing. It was uh, an idea that Warren George brought up. Um, but um, yeah, so we'll be probably at the boiler room uh, for dinner if you want to stick around. Thank you. Oh, Mike. the other thing. Yeah, one pair of states. Yeah. Um, I didn't live a mile away. Somebody wasn't thinking about staying in that because they want to pay for a hotel room. They got rooms in the house, at least two. Yeah, so that's that's available. And I think I'm trying to bring the alert. All of you know know about this, but it's not just the Medicare advantage of taking over Medicare. It's the encroachment in every area. Including right now, we're talking about Providence Healthcare and their anesthesiology issue. Hiring the group from um, Washington. <laughs> no, it, it doesn't matter if it's Washington. It's United Healthcare. That's who that group is. Sound physicians, right? Coming into into Oregon, it's the taking over of the clinic system. One of the clinic systems in Eugene. It's part of Care Oregon. Care Oregon has a contract with Optum. The, uh, for the so they're encroaching wherever they can. So this is this alert that you brought up is very important. Thank you. Private equity. Yes. Okay. And thank you for offering to put people up, Tom. Uh, truly proves that politics makes for strange bedtimes. <laughs> Thank you all very much. What, 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 one more thing. There you are. The, the catalyst, one of the catalysts for this meeting was one pair of states. Um, as you many of you met um, Chuck Pinocchio, who's online still here. Uh, he stayed here in Oregon for three months and spent time in Seattle uh, with generous hosts there. And he is in Washington, D.C., and he's knocked on 300 doors in the past month. And um, this is uh, one pair of states at work. So I will put another um, website on the blackboard. Please go to onepairstates.org and get involved and contribute what you can. And the bizarre website I put on the blackboard. The you put that in the chat. The bizarre website and the one pair of states was both online. Get it? Oh, yeah. Uh, Mike, the chat, Mike. Put that website in the chat. So yeah. Can... Charlie. Uh, so I just wanted to add a little bit more about why Chuck is in Washington, because uh, the, the most important project for one pair states right now is working on the state-based universal health care act, which has been mentioned, Rokana introduced that not too long ago. In Oregon, we got all four of our Democratic representatives as co-sponsors of bills, and so we have... We would like to challenge Washington to get all of their Democratic members as co-sponsors as well. We only got two out of eight so far. <laughs> okay, you can do better. We can do better. So, so um, anyway, it may not be totally necessary, but it would be awesome if it passed. <laughs> so, so we would like to see more people working through that. And uh, that's why Chuck knocked on 300 doors of staffers of Congress people in Washington.